Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm McKenna Jordan. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. And I'm very excited tonight to be joined by Martha Wells, who has been a local author and friend of the store for so, so long. Uh, we just love her and we're really excited for her and how much this uh, Murderbot series has taken off. So um, we're in for a treat tonight. We're also going to be joined by Kate Elliott, um, another a big, we're all big fans of hers as well. So this should be a great, great conversation. Um, as you get notifications that this event is live, I'm going to go ahead and mention a couple things. Um, so for the many of you who pre-ordered signed and personalized copies of Fugitive Telemetry, which we do still have a few signed copies available. I'm going to drop a link in the comments right now for that. Um, for those of you who had pre-ordered, we have shipped out about three quarters of those orders. We're um, working as fast as we can to get them packaged and shipped out. Martha came by on Friday and signed until her hand just was like this. So um, uh, those are all going out. You should receive tracking from stamps.com or from UPS when they ship. Be patient, it was a lot to, um, to package up, but they are on the way to you. I, again, I will mention, as I said, we have signed copies of Fugitive Telemetry. We have a handful of some of the other um, books in the series in hardcover, but we have sold through some. So if you're interested in a full set, um, check with us before ordering because we don't have them all um, left anymore signed. Um, I will also mention that uh, Kate has generously offered to uh, get us signed book plates if you want to order a copy of Unconquerable Sun. Um, I, the, that is also in the um, comments there, so you can order it um, at the same place. If you have questions, um, put them in the comments. They will auto import to me. I will see them both from um, Facebook comments and YouTube, um, the live chat. I will try to get to as many as I can for the second half of this chat. But um, first off, we're just going to let Martha and Kate chat. So I think that is all of my intro. Now I'm going to actually bring on the stars. Most of you know who this is, Martha. Hi. Hi. I'm going to do your official bio just in case. Um, so Martha Wells has written many fantasy novels, including The Wizard Hunters, Wheel of the Infinite, The Books of the Roxura series, and the Nebula nominated The Death of the ne Necromancer, as well as YA fantasy novels, short stories, and nonfiction. Her New York Times and USA Today bestselling Murder Bot series has won the Hugo, Nebula, Locus, and Alex Awards. Thank you again for being here tonight, and congrats on a new book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, we also have a guest interviewer in conversation person, and these are always my heroes because I know that a lot goes into doing these, so I'm super appreciative that Kate Elliott joined us this evening. Hi, how are you, Kate? Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm also gonna force everyone to listen to another bio here. So Kate Elliott has been writing science fiction and fantasy for 30 years. She's best known for her Crown of Stars epic fantasy series and the New York Times bestselling YA fantasy series, Court of Fives. Elliott's particular focus is immersive world building and centering women in epic stories of adventure amid transformative cultural change. She lives in Hawaii where she paddles outrigger canoes and spoils her schnauzer. And as a dog spoiling mom, I have all the admiration for that as well. <laughs> okay, I'm going away. We have lots of hellos from all over the place in the comments already. Um, like I said, pop your questions in there. There's no such thing as a dumb question and I'll try as many as I can later. But for now, I'll leave you to it. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, Martha, the the last time we saw each other in person was, as I like to say, last year, by which I mean 2019. Yes. Because um, like 2020 didn't happen, I, I guess. Um, but well, for the time <laughs> I tried to go. Anyway, in Dublin, mm -hmm. Ireland for Worldcon. And I want to ask you now the same question I asked you then. You can say you don't want to answer it, but I'm just. I enjoyed asking you this question so much when we had dinner Thursday night. <laughs> so why do I remember all these details? Anyway, um, so tell me, tell me, how do you feel about this worldwide reach and success of, of Murderbot, our favorite anxious person who hides in the bathroom? <laughs> I feel very overwhelmed. Um, 
I'm I've been writing since uh, well, I've been writing since I was a kid. I've been published since 1993 when my first book came out, The Element of Fire, and um, my career was not um, anything to write home about. I guess is the way to put it. Um, for quite a while, um, I uh, so and I had a huge career crash around. Um, I guess it was after it was between 2006 and yeah 2008 I think um, and that's when basically you you know you're still you're still writing and everything but you're you know you can't sell anything to publishers and then uh, kind of got back into publishing right at the point where I was getting ready to quit uh, my agent my new agent finally sold um, the Cloud Roads and the Serpent Sea the Cloud Roads had been making had visited every publisher. There was for about two years before Nightshade Books uh, uh, picked it up, um, and then it was kind of a slow, you know, upward. You know, it was doing my, I it was doing pretty well, and I thought, well, this is good. I mean, if I maintain this level, I'll be, I'll be happy with it. And then I was just going to write this dumb little robot story <laughs> that uh, that I decided to make it a novella, and we sold it to Tor.com, and then it just went bananas. And um, in a lot of ways, I just I set, haven't come to terms with it. It's just um, it's just so astonishing. I mean, it's like if I don't know if I became a vampire suddenly or an astronaut or something like that, it would still it would be, you know, somewhat along those lines of astonishment. This is just not a position I ever expected to be in. Um, I don't know if I'm handling it well. I guess I am. <laughs> You know, but it's just been, it's just been really, really strange. That's a, yeah, that's an interesting way to express it. Um, of course, I'm delighted because I've been reading your books for a long time and you know how much I love your work. Uh, so for me to see this, and I also know how much you struggled after the um, Wizard Hunters, that trilogy and what happened to yeah. that, that kind of like when, when people tell you, well, your career is over, but then it turned out it wasn't. And you know, it interests me that this book, that this novella that took off because the Rexura books, Cloud Roads, they were, as you said, they were doing, they were noticing people were reading them, but they mm -hmm. weren't, they weren't like a breakout. They were like a steady state kind of thing. Yeah. So what interests me is that Murderbot was something you just wrote because you felt like it. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't like sit down and say, I'm going to, I, I say this not because I think that sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a book with these set of features in it. And then that will be a big bestseller. But because of that sense in which as writers, we just need, sometimes we just need to believe that we have stories to tell. Yeah. I think that's really true. Um, because I don't know if they're still doing this. When I was first starting out, there was a lot of, and through the 90s, pretty much, there was a lot of um, formulas. Oh, just do this, this, and this, and you'll have a bestseller. And and people were kind of giving this kind of advice. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it just feels like that will never work because it's not, you know, it's not your genuine story. Like, um, we all play with so many of the same elements in science fiction and fantasy. Um just over and over again. And the only thing you bring to it that's, you know, that's unique is yourself. So if you're not writing something that, you know, you really want to write and you're not creating characters or, or writing characters, if you're doing media tie-ins that you really feel like you have something to say about, then, you know, it's, it, I feel like readers are going to, are going to pick up on that. What, what drew you to, do, do you know, you may not know, but do you know what drew you to the character of Murderbot? Uh, I, I think I know better now after talking to a lot of people who like the character um, or who really identify with the character. At the time, I don't think I had any idea. I think that mm. um, it was 2016. I was super angry about the world. <laughs> I mean, I've always been sort of angry about the world or you know, to different degrees, but this was a very high degree of angry about the world, you know, um, and I just needed a place to put that. And when I had the idea, it just seemed like kind of a, you know, a clever, the idea was like, a, 
you know, a person who was the security unit and was basically enslaved and had secretly freed themselves and then was going to have to kind of reveal that to save people that were worth saving, basically. And so that seemed like it just, you know, it's just kind of like, it's not that it's, um, it's not that mind blowing an idea. But when I started writing the character, I realized, okay, is it going to be in the first person? It's going to have to be and got the first line. It was just like, you know, I just poured everything into it. Um, so yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I think that a lot of it I was writing, I was using a lot of my own experience and I think I kind of didn't realize until I was writing that character. Um, I knew that I was not neurotypical, um, but I don't think I realized to the extent that um, I was not neurotypical. There was a lot of things I just thought, well, I was, well, I'm weird. Um, and I know I have some OCD issues and things like that, but I don't think I realized to the extent that um, um, my brain was strange. <laughs> so. I don't know. Murder, murder bot seems totally relatable and normal to me. <laughs> well, I think it, I, I think that's the thing. I think a yeah, lot of exactly. so many people um, will will come and somebody asked me if I had a sensitivity reader for it. Now it's just like that's just me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just writing myself. Yeah, it's just, it's just me, you know. <laughs> so I guess some people think it's a very artificially constructed character, as opposed to just, you know. One of the ways I write it, I is if I'm going along and I realize Murderbot's made a mistake about something that it should have, it should have looked at this or it should have, it's done this thing wrong. I just keep that and have Murderbot realize it made a mistake. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the 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 feeling of verisimilitude. Um, it also came from working with software when I was a programmer and working with databases. Because oh. a lot of people think that I know a lot about AI. And it's like, if you, you know, you can see on the book, that I don't know anything about AI, real AI. But what I do know about is um, trying to explain software to users and um, the things that can go wrong um with a bad upgrade and, and and that kind of thing so that's kind of a lot of what i put into it and to using databases to solve problems see now that's interesting because i didn't know that about the software and the databases but it explains why to me as a reader it feels i i can see where that comes out and i can see how that affects the way murderbot functions as a recognize a a person, a character who has recognizable to me human characteristics, but then there's another layer there that doesn't process quite the same way I do. And I think it's probably running it through that. So that's really interesting. Yeah, there. I think there was a, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know why it's wrong with my throat. Uh, there was a scene in Network Effect where Murderbot has to look at the screen and record the data to then be able to put it in, parse it into, you know, records and, and so that they can actually search on it um, it's when it's in the shuttle. And um, that came from people accidentally destroying, pe certain people accidentally destroying databases and then having to <laughs> basically uh, recreate them from, from, from scratch. Yeah. And yeah. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in it. You know, one of the things that what so impresses me about um, the murder bot stories. I, I know there's like a two part question here, I guess. One is you're doing in a way what I call the naive narrator. So we read, we read past what murder bot is saying. We read things that murder bot isn't aware of or can't know. Um, there are some really, really funny scenes speaking as a parent when Murderbot is dealing with the teenager, right? Where the teenager is saying things and I can picture exactly what's going on and I know the tone of voice and everything and Murderbot has just taken it, you know, everything at face value. Um, did that was, that, was that something you were doing deliberately or were you just writing so deep in that point of view that it turned out that way? It's a combination of both. Um, Murderbot is really unreliable about its uh, emotional state. It's very unreliable about its abilities. It always, um, 
it's not necessarily being self-deprecating. It really does think it, you know, because it's not perfect. Um, right. It thinks it's like doing a, a terrible job. Uh, if anything goes, and it's like the things that are, a lot of times the thing that goes wrong are not something it could do anything about anyway, but it blames itself for everything. Um, so it's really unreliable about its capabilities in some, in a lot of ways, it's very unreliable about um, um, what it thinks other people, it's convinced Thiago hates it. And Thiago has some re in network effect and Thiago has some reservations, but he doesn't hate it. Garathan has some reservations that are really actually very rational things to, to think about, but, but um, Rudderwise convinced it. So it's like, there's a lot of emotional extremes, which I felt was, um, which is I'm really, when I'm really deep into the character, feels very right for a character that's gone through everything Murderbot's gone through. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an unreliable narrator. It's not, um, it's kind of a weird combination of being incredibly honest about um, some things, on the things that it's getting, um, that it feels and its observations and also just being a person who has um, so much going on in their head that they're not always making the right judgment about this information. So, yeah. It's a great juggling act. You, you, you know, you've, so you wrote, you wrote the first one. And did you already have the sequels in mind or did Tor, mm -hmm dot com come to you and say, hey, we would like more of these. Well, when they bought the first novella, they asked for a second novella and it didn't have to be a sequel. It could have been anything else. Right. Um, and but at that point, after I'd, I'd already finished it, you know, when it was it was sold after it was finished, um, I thought, well, I kind of really want to do a second one. I started kind of having um, an idea about it coming back to Mensa at some point, and maybe rescuing her in some really tense situation. And then I started Artificial Condition. Obviously, I didn't get anywhere close to that point in the story. Um, and that's funny because I didn't even know Art was going to be a character at that point. Art was literally really? a paragraph about a transport ship that had helped Murderbot. Because I realized partway into this first draft that was going to get thrown out that Murderbot needed to change its really logically needed to change its appearance uh, to be able to kind of avoid uh, being identified as second, especially considering that they actually use sec units in this little um, mining thing it was going to. And so this was just a paragraph. And as I was going along, I was like, you know, that's really, it needs to be on stage. It just feels fake. It's not working. So I went back to the beginning. And usually one of the problems I have with these novellas is I start at the wrong spot and I end up writing five or 10,000 words or 20,000 words and have to go back and take it all out. And then, um, start again but then I did that with artificial condition I started with Murderbot just pretty much just after it's left um, and met art and art sort of stepped on stage and was this really interesting character and uh, by the end of it I wanted uh, you know I'd planned what was going to happen in the ending but, but to the extent that I plan stuff which is not very um, as soon as I'd done that, I, I really wanted Art to get back in the story, but I really can think of a realistic way, the way I'd set it up for them to encounter each other, considering what I wanted Murderbot to be doing. Um, so when, I think, I can't remember exactly when they asked for the other, no, I think we asked about that, is after I finished Artificial Condition, I think uh, All Systems Red was coming out. I think it had already come out, maybe. Um, and I asked them, so we, we want me to do two more because well, I told my agent to ask them if they wanted me to do two more. And they said, sure. And then that's why I started writing uh, Rogue Protocol and then Exit Strategy. So there was never any idea of it becoming a series at the beginning. And it's so funny to me that I don't, I don't think I've ever planned out. Um, the only books I've actually planned out that would be sequels was um, the Elrian Trilogy and then the last two Rexura books, which were sold together. And um, I knew it was going to be one was, you know, they were going to be a set, basically one big story in two books. But because my career has been, has always been where I could not guarantee to a reader I would be able to finish a series. Yeah. 
So they've all been standalone because like all the cloud roads books were basically could have been each one had to have an ending had to bring the characters to a conclusion because I never knew if I was going to be able to write another one. So that's kind of the way I was still operating is, is kind of trying to get, you know, a conclusion that would be satisfying, but leave the story in a spot where it could continue. Um, so, yeah, I think by the time I finished, I guess, no, I think I'd finished Exit Strategy. It was by the time, I think, of the Worldcon in San Jose when it had been, you know, there, it had won a uh, Nebula and it had been nominated for the Hugo. Was it sort of starting to dawn on me that, yeah, this was, this was steamrolling into a big hit and which was just still, it's like, <laughs> is is yeah um and i think one of the reasons why it's been hard for me to kind of realize that is my life has not changed that much yeah. and that's partly yeah. because of the pandemic um last year was when i would have had a book tour i had gotten invited to um um utopiales in france and um, a convention in germany so i would have been traveling a lot more and seeing a lot more different people and um and I think that would have been probably more, re, you know, the reality would have sunk in. But instead, I was just home for <laughs> yeah a year and however long it's been. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because so so All Systems Red came out in 2017, right? Yeah, yeah, because you did the you did a Magic the Gathering set of stories, which ran in the beginning of 2018. Yeah, I actually I'm trying to remember now. I was writing them. I got that contract, it would have been, I think at the end of November, because I had to fly to Seattle right before, I think maybe it was after Thanksgiving, and um, for just like a day to talk to everybody and, and meet the teams. And, um, and then I was writing it over December, and then December, January, February, yeah, I think it was, um, it took about three to four months. It started to slow down once the story started getting published on the website, because then we were having, we weren't having to go back over stuff as much. We were getting done basically with this long, this, this, this outline of stories. Um, I'm trying to remember which book I was working on. Yeah. Because at that point you would well, have, even in 2017, as you were the end of 2017, it had come out, but it still hasn't, yeah, it, it, you, you were still taking uh, work for hire, which I which I'm not which yeah. I'm not criticizing. I don't mean you, but I mean, I'm not saying that work for hire is bad. It can be great for people for different reasons. But it's also something that if you have a really big series, you don't necessarily need to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, at that point, I had no idea. I think I must have still been working on, I can't remember which one. It was probably either Rogue Protocol or Exit Strategy because I remember having to stop, um, I think, working on Magic the Gathering to do a revision or a copy edit or something of one of the novellas during, um, I think, during December. Because um, I was very stressed because it's like the novellas had fairly tight, or not the, the, the magic stories had fairly tight deadlines because they had certain yeah. days they yeah. had on the website and they did need to be read over by several different people. And so we can make sure, um, um, get their changes put in and things and, and get critiqued. But, um, yeah, so I, <laughs> at that point, again, I think it was probably, I don't know, it was probably late in 2018 when I had any idea. Any idea. <laughs> any idea. <laughs> I just remember your face when we when we had dinner in Dublin in 2019 when I asked you this question you you looked shell shocked. Well, that's perhaps yeah. not the best analogy, but you know you you were just kind of like stunned, right? Like I don't even know. It was great. And, yeah, that hasn't stopped at all. So <laughs> that, that's well, it's fabulous, and it shouldn't because it's a fantastic series. Now, you it was it hard to, you know, I love Network Effect. Um, for many reasons, but that moment where Murderbot hides in the bathroom to get away from everybody was, I felt that, I felt that moment. Um, but was it hard to go from the novel back to the novella length? 
did you have to readjust or does the novella length feel natural to you with these stories? Uh, it wasn't really hard. Um, basically, it's when I get an idea for a story, I kind of know how long it's going to take to do uh -huh. it. And Fugitive Telemetry was very much a novella sized idea. If it had been, if it had to be extended into a novel, I would have had to um, rethink a lot of things uh, about the pacing and what they were going to actually find. It wouldn't have just taken place on preservation. It probably would have started on preservation and gone out, you know, right. possibly to the, um, well, I don't want to spell too much of it, but it would have, it would have, it would not have stayed on preservation. It would not have been a bottle, like what they call that in TV, the bottle story where you just stay in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it wouldn't have been that. Um, so it'd have been a really a different, a different thing. And there would have had to be a lot more characters brought in and everything. Um, but I kind of did want to write a little concentrated uh, um, murder mystery. And actually I've been, I've been working on a sequel for network effect and it was kind of not, I think I'd kind of burn myself out a bit. It took me 18 months to write network effect and it's, it's not that long. Oh. But yeah. And usually it takes me about, you know, a year to write a book that long. And this was, um, 18 months of stopping and starting. And, you know, probably most of that time was working on the first 50,000 words, um, and writing a bunch of stuff and throwing it out and writing a bunch of stuff and throwing it out. Uh, it took me, I don't want to even, I could look, I, I keep my stats of what I'm working on, I, of how much I write every day that I write, uh, in a file for each, for each book or story or whatever. So I don't really want to go back and look at how long it took me to say, get the first chapter because in the first chapter, the original first chapter, I think they were, sometimes they were on a spaceship and sometimes they were on a planet. Um, I don't know where the water planet came from, but somehow that worked when nothing else did, you know. Um, the, the, the general idea of what was going to happen in that first chapter was the same. Uh, once they got, and sometimes they were on preservation station and that didn't work. And um, um, so, yeah. <laughs> So, so was, the, was the was fugitive telemetry easier in that sense because you it was a you a confined space well a bottle story yeah. I like uh, that it was, term. it was easier to find the starting point because basically I was like I'm having really you know I'm I'm kind of burned out but I need to get something going um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna free write and I wrote this the the first line of Murderbot looking down at the dead human. <clears throat> And so I started going with that scene. And after a little bit, I was like, yeah, I think this is it. I think this is the beginning of a novella. I'll just go with it. Because originally it was just going to be a scene that maybe it would work and I would stick it in somewhere. And it was like, no, this is the story. Murderbot's going to solve a murder mystery. a lot, Basically a locked space station murder mystery. That's so, great. So you just signed. You just signed a big contract with yeah. Tor um, for six books. Yeah. Or Which, six six entities. They may not all be entities. novels. At least two yeah. of them will be novellas, I think. So yeah, that was that was kind of a big leap of faith because for the first six months of, of uh time warp year, I was completely blocked. Yeah. Um it just couldn't I had tried to I was trying to work on again the sequel to network effect and um in novella form and novel form. And I just, it was like, I had kind of, that part of my brain had derailed. I couldn't hold all that information in my brain to get started. And there's, you know, I have like, I don't know, a lot of attempts files started with this, with this story. And I even know where, it, where sometimes parts of it are going, <laughs> but um, they're just, you know, they, they read pretty good for, you know, several pages and you can tell it's just like, I can, it's, it's gone off the rails. Um, just trying to make this, well, decision fatigue is a big thing for writers. I mean, we all know that and uh, just yeah. trying to make uh, how many characters are going to be involved and what's going to be happening and just all that kind of stuff is just not working for me. Yeah. Um, so I basically had to stop and, you know, I'll try to take a break and then, you know, things just got worse and worse. And then around July, um, um, I was one of the many uh, fantasy writers who got into the, the Chinese drama, The Untamed. 
and <laughs> I kind of blew in it. And I think it's 50 episodes long. And I watched it, I think, over the course of like four or five days, which seems like not that much time. A friend of mine actually made it in a weekend, which even I'm a big TV watcher, and even I find that astonishing. I know that's, yeah, I can that's watch like two episodes of a show uh, a night. Yeah, it's like more, there's that's like more hours than there are in an actual weekend. Yeah. Um, and that kind of blew my brain out. And I started thinking about, well, I no try a fantasy again. Um, and I started working on that. And that finally kind of took hold. And um, I kept working on it going, I'm not going to want to keep continue this. This is too weird. And then I go back to it. And it's like, this is deliciously weird. I'm going to keep working on it. it. And so um, now that's about um, 75,000 words done so far and not finished yet. So um, hopefully I'll finish by the deadline. Um, so I wouldn't have taken that contract if I hadn't been working on something. I would have just felt too yeah. like I'm making promise. What if my, what if I, cause ever, whenever you get kind of blocked like that, you're thinking, what if I never write again? And um, yeah. it, it happens to some people. And so, yeah. But how nice that you were able to do something different because sometimes I think we do just need to do, especially if someone's been doing something for a while, even if yeah. it's great, it's like, I want to change up a little bit. And you've written both science fiction and fantasy. I mean, I, I'm not one who feels that science fiction and fantasy are like really different. To me, they're both like literature of the fantastic. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if you feel that they're like hugely different in approach or anything. But no, one of the questions I get a lot is, well, how do you change gears to write science yeah. fiction from fantasy and how hard is it? And it's like, it's all like, oh. it's not like I'm writing, you know, hard science fiction. It's, this is basically super science technology magic <laughs> as opposed to magic magic. Yeah. Oh, McKenna just posted oh. um, uh, that we have, oh, we've been talking for 30 minutes. Oh my gosh. But, um, oh my gosh. One thing okay, I, I, I have, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, one thing I wanted to say is um, I've read your books for a long time. Um, I love, love, I think like Court of Fives um, was my favorite for a while. Well, no, it was, it was um, the first book in the, um, the, the, the Ice Age. Oh, Spirit, Cold Magic, yeah. Cold Magic, yeah. I'm bad at remembering too many uh, c's too many c's, too many c's. but um i love the cold magic uh, trilogy and i love the court of fives I, I urge people to go if you like murder bot and you like space opera to go read unconquerable sun because that was such a fun book and one of the things i really liked about it that you did was the way you brought in um the media that is you know it's a it's a far future in their um in the the main characters are very prominent people and are being basically followed by space paparazzi and they are their performance in these, in these films and the, the, the of these things that were happening to them are being like graded on, you know, kind of an American idol type show. And it's like, this is so the way our, you know, our um, media is trending in, um, yeah. With, with reality shows and all that, but I thought it was so cool to see that. I don't think I'd ever seen anybody do that before. You know, it's interesting because Alexander the Great, of course, and this is at the, the tagline for this book is gender spun Alexander the Great in space. And that is actually what the inspiration, but what's interesting is Alexander the Great himself did this back in the day. He understood you know, he had a historian who went with him and the historian would write, I don't know, dispatches and then they would be sent out to wherever. And of course it would take weeks or months to reach people, but he, he only one person could sculpt Alexander's head, you know, with these busts and only one person could do murals of him because he understood this idea of creating your image. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have said it like that but he, he understood himself. <laughs> yeah, he, he understood it. And so I did combine those two elements, our own media, um, the whole K-pop thing. Um, and, and then this thing that Alexander himself did, I wanted to bring that out in it. 
Because one of the things, and it, this is the last, and then we'll go to, I, it looks like we have questions, but I wanted to ask you one more thing about Murderbot. One of the things that I love that you do in it is it's actually a story that's very critical of elements of our modern society, but you slide it in so deftly. So the, the way in which people are indentured the way in which people are you know, controlled by corporations and the hold corporations have over their lives and Murderbot's surprise when it turns out that there, there's one place that people don't behave like that. And did, did you, is that something that just kind of came out through who Murderbot was or was it something that you deliberately set out to do? It came out through who Murderbot was because once you construct that character and what has happened to it and why it's in this situation. <clears throat> you have to build a world that would be okay with that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that blossoms out into basically if it's okay to enslave constructs, it's going to be okay to enslave people, you know, just regular people too. Um, and that's what they're going to do. They're probably not going to call it that, you know. No, they uh, never, they never do. They never do, but it's an outgrowth of like fast food restaurants that pay people in um, in little like gift cards that then they're docked their pay for for you know uh, spending the money that they're actually being paid, you know. But these fees and everything, and just it's an outgrowth of that. It's like it's making sure you have people who can't leave. That's and the company store, right? The, the, company uh, the old company store. store from like the mining industry back in the 19th century. Yeah, it's like none of this is new. It's just that, you know, sometimes we have protections against it and then people forget how terrible it is and we lose all the protections and it starts up again exactly as it is. Exactly, except, yeah. Except with technological innovations that make it worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one of the things. And what, what I love about it is that it's always there, present in the, in the story. And it's, it's inescapable. Yeah. Um, but it's not heavy. It's, it's like the air you breathe. And I like that sense in which we get a taste of this, but totally through the, how the story flows rather than a lecture. If that oh, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And it's like, you see the, you know, the thing about, oh, well, you could become an indentured servant to live on Mars and it would be cool. And it's like, <laughs> would it, would it really? There was just a Doctor Who episode like a couple yeah. of years ago where they were on a space station where the workers had to pay for their oxygen and in their space to yeah. live. And it's like, and the people are running out of oxygen and stuff. And it's like, that's not that far fetched, you know? Well, I mean, The Expanse, The Expanse does this. The TV, yeah. well, it's a, a book series by yeah. James S.A. Corey and now a, an Amazon TV series. And it does that with water and air. Are, yeah, you have to pay for it, and they're rationed, and some people can. Anyway, it's it's just it's really great that I love seeing that aspect of life shown in science fiction and in fantasy as well. Because sometimes it gets ignored, and the idea that people wouldn't really do that—that that was just what people did in the old days. Only people do it today. Yeah. <laughs> people you know? would do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so do you want to tackle some of those questions? Yeah, let's let's try to take some questions. Okay. All right, so we've got a lot. Um, I apologize if I don't get to some of them, but uh, we'll start with this one. I'm going to do them somewhat chronologically. Okay, so Evan was wondering, is there anything more you can tell us about the preservation bots? Not really that, that you know, when I, the next time I do a story set on preservation, there'll probably be more information, but um uh, just that they do have a lot more autonomy than a bot in a corporate setting would. It's not right. autonomy, but they do have more. Okay. Um, where did the name murder bot come from? I think I didn't make it up. The, the idea of murder bot has been around for a while. That's calling someone or something a murder bot. Um, uh, so it was kind of just in the, in, I, I read a lot of social media and I, you know, I read a lot of stuff <laughs> online. So it was, it had been around for a while. Um, so that's where I, I, you know, just took it from. Perfect. 
Okay, um, this one is about audiobooks, and I, I imagine that Kate also can uh, answer this. Do you have any input on the choice of voice actors for your audiobooks, and how do you feel hearing your characters voice acted for the first time? I think I had approval, but um, the thing, it's kind of like casting directors are like art directors. It's like, unless you know how to do that, then you should probably stay out of it. <laughs> um, so they chose Kevin R. Free and then, and, then, and then said, this is the person we're looking at and sent me his, um, uh, the websites that they have on Audible and the other uh, um, recorded books and everything that had samples of his work. Um, and so, yeah, he was, he was perfect. I thought he was a perfect choice. And it's really cool. It's very different because, you know, the voice that you're hearing an actor do is never match what, you, what is in your head. But it's kind of like, it's a different, it's kind of, it's really exciting to hear because it, it, it's a different version of it and it makes you see the stories and stuff in different ways. Kate, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I'm the same in terms of the expertise, you know, their job is to know what they're doing. And I tend to trust, I don't trust everybody to know what they're doing, but in a case like this. So I have been told, you know, hey, we're thinking about this. Um, Natalie Naudis was uh, with Unconquerable Son. They said, well, we'd like to use her. What do you think? And I thought to myself, what I think is I'm going to go listen to some excerpts and she sounds good, right? Plus she can pronounce Mandarin correctly. So that was like a huge plus. And she's gotten, she's gotten a lot of great reviews for the audiobook of Sun. Excellent. I'm going to paraphrase this next question because otherwise it's going to block one of you. But um, Misting Wolf was essentially wondering, she's been writing for a long time and was wondering how you keep up the passion and how does she get back on track if she loves the story and characters, but maybe is in a bit of a rut? I think that, um, I mean, usually the thing is going back and reading it from the beginning, but if you're in a bit of a rut, it may be because your plot has gone wrong. One thing, I, as if you're a pantser like me, and even if you, sometimes if you outline ahead, you can write yourself into a corner and just be trying to go forward beating your head into a wall that you can't see. And usually what that is, is the story in the back of your head that you want to write, you have somehow got off track of that and are doing something different. That's not going to lead where you want to go. And part of your brain that has the story knows that and won't let you go move forward. Or when you do try to move forward, you just don't, you're not happy with it. And it would be nice if those two parts of your brain would communicate, but often they don't. And so one thing I would say is just kind of look at what you're doing in your plot that you're having trouble with and step back from that and say, do we really want to go in this direction? Is there something, is there something more exciting? Because especially when I was um, starting out a while back, uh, a long time ago, dinosaurs were over here, that kind of thing. Um, I would be thinking of exciting things that could happen to the characters and then wanting to even thinking, well, but I'm going to write that. I'm going to write something else that's more conventional. And realizing that what I needed to do is throw out the conventional stuff and go with the exciting thing I wanted to write and think of a way to make that work. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, you have to kind of step back at it and look at what you're doing is like, have you written yourself into a place where you want to go? How about you, I, Kate? I, well, I, I agree with everything that Martha said. And I also, I think an, another, I mean, there's many answers to this question. Another answer sometimes is related to that, but this idea that someone's standing behind you, an invisible, intangible someone saying, that's not working. What are you doing this for? What's the point? Or whatever, or you're doing it wrong. And for me, sometimes that voice can get so loud that it ruins, that it kind of drowns out that the love I have for writing because I hear the voice more than the love. And at times like that, I either have to like take that voice and put it in a closet and give it some comfy, you know, cushions to sit on and a cup of tea. Um, and then I, I, that's one option or one way to deal with it. And another one is simply for myself to let go of the outcome, to say, I don't know what's gonna happen with this thing I'm writing. There's no way to know. I could finish it and never sell it. I could finish it and, you know, people would love it. I don't know, but I'm just going to write it for me. And sometimes I have to come back to that. I'm writing it. Well, actually all the time, really. 
I'm writing it for me. That's what the that's who the first draft is for. Excellent. Um, a couple very specific questions. Any tidbits about the upcoming Witch King series? Will it also be first person? It will not be first person. It'll be back in kind of, I kind of do a th close third person point of view uh, this, that I did like for the Rex Hero novels and my other work. And that's what it'll be in. Other than that, I'm still trying to figure out how to describe it to myself. So <laughs> I'm not describing it to, I had to write a summary for it. Like last week while I was on vacation and um, yeah, <laughs> and I, was, I was forcing one of my friends to read what I with the whole like 75,000 word file so she could help me. And yeah, and it still was, I'm not sure I, we did a very good job of it, but um, no tidbits. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Kate. I think this is going to cover you for a second, but I'm going to read it verbatim so I don't mess okay. it up. Okay. Um, did current events and conversations about police violence and civil liberties affect the development of fugitive telemetry or the writing of a mystery where the protagonist works alongside police? It did, because I was thinking a lot about that, is how preservation, which has a very um, sort of people-oriented approach to government of, of service to its citizens, of that the structure of government exists to make sure everybody you know, is, is, is not just surviving, but is um, basically having fulfilling happy lives and that, and trying to basically um, make a positive, you know, maintain a positive environment in a lot of ways, how their idea of policing would be. And I don't think they, in the fact that they don't have, um, people who are, are police in the same sense that we do, they have like the the main investigator is also and basically an arbitrator who works on, um, you know, resolving, getting people to talk to resolve disagreements and that kind of thing. And the fact that they're mostly working on the port and the cargo regulations of which they have a lot and kind of um, safety for the whole um, um, station, which for them is a lot of, you know, maintaining um, techno techno technological safety elements like the airlocks and, and the protections and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I did think a lot about it. It's like, why does a station like this need police in the first place unless they have other functions that are more important like their, um, you know, their, their cargo regulations and their safety regulations and stuff and thinking about how, um, and they probably, you don't see it in the story, but they would probably have like mental health you know, um, people who um, respond for mental health emergencies, which I think is an important thing that we, we need to do and move that away from, you know, punitive, uh, a punitive group to someone, to a group that's basically more medical, um, trying to actually help people and solve problems than just throwing people in jail and shooting them and whatever. But um yeah, so it did. It did very much. Um, it, there was something I was thinking about as I was writing it. Um, I'm going to get to another um, politically and culturally relevant question in just a second. But I do want to interject another ad for we do have signed copies of Fugitive Telemetry left in stock, a handful of them and some of the other hardbacks. So I've got a link in the comments. Um, a lot of you I've already heard me earlier, but in case you missed it, we've mailed out about three quarters of the hundreds of books that Martha signed on Friday. So bear with us. If you have received a tracking notification from stamps.com, your copies are on the way. And thanks to everyone for ordering those signed and personalized copies. I also want to take just a second. I know you've already talked a little bit about Unconquerable Sun with Kate, but I always like to give our guest interviewers just a chance, a, a small chance to talk about their latest book, which as I mentioned earlier, Kate has offered to um, send signed book plates for. But could you tell us a little bit about Unconquerable Sun in your own words? Um, I'm not prepared for this. I was just <laughs> prepared with questions from Martha. Uh, it, it is gender spun Alexander the Great in space. I wanted to write a, a I, I love space opera and I love epics. Most of my work has been in the form of epic fantasy and earlier in my career of a more epic um, science fiction. Uh, I like that scope, and I have long felt that the story of Alexander the Great would work really well um, as an epic 
in space because that changes things up a lot. And then of course, because of who I am, I wanted to change the Alexander character to a woman. And uh, I think the biggest decision I had to make when I was deciding how to write this book was I had the choice between keeping it in the kind of patriarchal world that we would have seen in ancient Greece, in which case the story would be about a, a young woman who overcame you know, all these things. But then that's not the story of Alexander the Great because he was born, you know, the he was the son of a king. It was expected that he could, because he was because he was good at things and he was smart and he was physically fit um, and he was ambitious, it was just simply assumed that he could be a king and that he could be a ruler and that he could lead armies. And none of this, the only thing that was different from him, about him from some of the other people was just that his vision was really, his vision and his ambition and what they call his pothos, his longing to do something amazing was a little, was bigger than other, was greater, greater than other people's. Um, and so I wanted to write that story with a woman at the center because we really, we see a lot of women more and more and more compared to when I was young and Martha and I were reading when we were young. We just didn't see that many stories with women at the center, these epic stories of adventure that I just love. Um, and even now seeing a, and, and there's issues with writing military um, science fiction and military fantasy, I think. Um, but at the same time, I just wanted to write that kind of character as a woman in which no one ever questions her ability to lead. Excellent. And no one ever, no one ever does. I mean, there may be, there's trouble and there may be intrigue, but it's not about whether or not she can lead. And because there are many of your fans in the audience also, what is, uh, what do we expect next from you? Uh, I have a fantasy novella coming out in January, 2022. It just has had a title change. So it's now called Servant Mage and that's coming out with tour.com, which is the same as the Murderbot books. Uh, and then I'm almost finished with the second book of the Sun Trilogy which is called Furious Heaven, and it should be out in spring 2022, if all goes well. Wish me luck. <laughs> all luck, headed your way. All right, so um, back to Murderbot. Can you talk about balancing race, gender, and pronouns in the books? Um, for example, Murderbot keeps requesting it. Um, yeah, uh, it does, because it's not human. I mean, it's it doesn't it's not human and it doesn't want to be human, um, so that's why it, it does that. Um, I'm not sure about how to describe. Did you want me to describe how I'm balancing race and gender? And, and I'm not sure what that is, but yeah, I mean, I, I think about them all the time. You know, when I'm. Um, I think they're just confirming that there's some intentionality there. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. When I'm I'm adding the the characters that Murderbot is encountering, I really do think about um, the the makeup of the characters, what the demographic basically. Also, um, one of the things is try to imagine the future and try to make think up family structures that will that um, are different than what we have, but are also kind of outgrowths of what we have now of um, trying to make it look not like just our society with, you know, rockets and so forth. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, have you ever considered writing Murderbot from, excuse me, have you considered writing from anyone Murderbot interacts with or does that not work for the story? Well, there's that one story, the one that's on tour.com right now, um, that's from Dr. Mensa's perspective. And it's a little short story that's set after exit strategy and before fugitive telemetry and network effect. Um, I am thinking about doing another one, but I don't want to talk too much about it because um, chances are, if I talk too much about it, I won't write it. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's uh, been one of that's my good. problems. Yes. So yeah, I've, I've, I've considered it. Yeah. Doing another one. Okay. We have a question specifically for Kate. 
How did you come to the choice of a mix of third person point of view and first point first person point of view and unconquerable son? It, not easily. I struggled with that, but the Persephone chapters had to be written in first person. Um, and I couldn't write Sun in first person because Sun is the Alexander the Great analog. It's not a strict analog, but, and I just don't, I need a little distance from that character. And the other two characters in the first book, I also, they're not, well, Persephone has to be first person because she's telling her own story in her own way. And I was worried that people wouldn't, would be too, taken aback by the switching. There's also past and present tense. It switches. There's two characters are in present tense and two are in past tense. And in the end, I just decided to do it. I just said, mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to let go of worrying about the outcome. And in general, with rare exceptions, people have just gone with it. Mm -hmm. Once maybe they're surprised at first and they go, wait, what was this switch? But then it's fine. Then they get used to it and it's fine. So um, I am glad that I had the courage to stick with what my heart was telling me I needed to do. Yeah. Great. It really uh, Thank you. So another question, very specific. How did art's personality develop as you wrote it since it started as just a throwaway paragraph? And then there's a follow-up I won't put on here, but basically is there anything else that you wanted to add in book two or five about art, but you weren't able to? Um, the only thing I, I wanted to add is probably stuff that will come in later about um, a little bit more about how art was developed and how the, that, that culture that it comes from basically functions. Um, I kind of like surprising people. Um, um, but yeah, arts, per, art, arts personality. Um, I was, I was doing a, um, a talk with a, another group and the people were asking questions. And one of the questions was why is art so aggressive <laughs> and so mean? And it's like, because it's, um, it likes to be um, the most powerful um, artificial entity within range. <laughs> and um, once I kind of got that aspect of art's personality, which came out really quickly, um, the rest of it kind of follows. Um, so it's a, it's, I like to kind of find my characters along with the readers. So I don't, you know, I don't sit there and think, well, I'm going to write this kind of character. It's like I start writing this person talking to other people and that's what it comes out of. And a lot of art's personality developed in that immediate conversation with, um, Murderbot, where it's like I wanted it to scare Murderbot, and then coming up with the kind of personality that would do that, and um, yeah, that's that's where it came from. There's okay. a weird magic in character creation, right? Where yeah. did they come from? And some of them you, ha some of them I find I struggle with, and some of them they're just there. They yeah, just like drop, and you know them. Yeah, and that's and I that's no the way it works. It's like the um, I've, I've noticed I can't characterize a new character alone. They have to be with yeah. other characters that they yeah. can talk to and you can start figuring out who that person is by the way they talk to them. Yeah. I love talking with authors though and hearing how, how often characters come fully formed. They just spring fully formed into their brains. It's such a, a magical thing to, to hear about. Um, we have a reading question, well, a reading and writing question, and then I'm gonna, ask a question for both of you. Do you read other books while you're trying to write or do you try to isolate yourself from other fiction until you're done with your drafts? Kate, why don't you start this one? Um, I often don't, well, there's, there's, there's pandemic and before pandemic. So before mm -hmm. pandemic, I would tend to avoid reading books that are in the same subgenre. So if I was writing an epic fantasy, I probably wouldn't be reading many epic fantasies. Or if I was writing, writing a space opera, I probably wouldn't be reading any space operas. Um, but other than that, I'm usually fine to read fiction, to relax or break, get a break. And also I find other people's work inspiring, not just, just because 
it reminds me of why I enjoy writing because I enjoy reading. And um, pandemic, I've actually struggled to read fiction. I'm not quite sure why. So I've read a lot more nonfiction. I am still reading some fiction, just not as much as normal. Yeah. I'm about the same way. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, uh, I read all the time. Um, my pandemic reading has been really uh, erratic as opposed to fairly steady the way it usually is. Um, but a lot of times when I'm, if I'm stuck on something and I'm going to read someone else's book, a lot of times it'll just like start percolating and loosen stuff up and I'll be able to figure out where I need to go with my story. And that's just basically, it's partly, it's distracting. It's partly like I'm thinking about what their characters are doing and it's just kind of sparking stuff. And it's like, this character needs to go in a different direction, you know, kind of. So it's like, yeah, it's really, I think reading is kind of really important to the process. I'll, I think I would have trouble trying to write something without having anything else to, you know, without having that kind of rest period of being able to read something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I have made it to most of the questions. I, If I missed one, I'm sorry. There were so many comments and um, great discussion. So I hope I didn't miss anything, but I always like to end my author talks with a very particular question. Um, what books, and this is for both of you, did you read in your formative years? And at which point did you know you wanted to be a writer? Was there a book that sparked that? Um, and Martha, we'll start with you. Oh, oh wait, Kate, do you know? No, if you know, you go oh, ahead. This is so easy for me, Lord of the Rings. I read it when I was 13, that was it. That Done. was it. And you Done. wanted to write, like this is what you wanted to do. I was I was drawing maps and, and um, probably writing little things before that but from 13 that was that was just it for me i i was just so fell into that world and i wanted to create not that world but create a world that made me feel the way that book did only with girls in it <laughs> <laughs> or more girls in it yeah yeah great great answer how about you martha well, I wanted to write real early on, and I don't exactly know why. I kind of did the same thing you did with Lord of the Rings, but I was doing it with Godzilla movies <laughs> on, uh, on TV, <laughs> one of the five TV channels we had. With that explains so much now to me. I understand you better. It does. It does. And I would make giant maps of Monster Island with typing paper and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I read a lot. I, I read a lot of a, of adult fantasy uh, when I should have been reading children's books and stuff. Uh, but adult fantasy tended to have more female characters on the cover. So I was reading science fiction fantasy. Um, things like Barbara Hambly, I think, was yeah, really formative yeah. for me. Because that kind of adventure fantasy with a lot of uh, mystery solving in it is, is uh, kind of similar to what I do. So, um, yeah, uh, and that, and early on it was uh, Andrew Norton. I read a lot of Andrew Norton, which has a lot of, and I think also the the, the 70s uh, feminist kind of new wave stuff um, where there wasn't as much separation between science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. Um, um, that uh, was a huge influence on me. I want to put in a, a shout out to CJ Cherry, who was a big another big influence on me because she was just writing stuff her early work was just different than what everyone else was doing. Yeah. The Pride and, of Demure, that was a, that was a. Yeah, and even before, even her stuff before that, the um, Union Alliance stuff, uh, it, it was, it, I had never read anything like it and it just made my brain kind of start vibrating. That's why I love to end with that question because it brings great memories back and put smiles on people's faces. So <laughs> everyone loves talking about those books they read um, when they were younger. All right, um, thank you all so much. We've had a huge crowd watching. Um, I am so appreciative again to Martha for coming by and signing and signing and signing and personalizing copies and they're in the mail. Um, thank you again, Kate, so much for doing this interview. I loved listening to it and it was a, one, a wonderful time talking with both of you. Um, I am going to say good evening and sign us all off. Bye. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all of you. <laughs>